Good morning, church. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Well, today we are finishing up our message series on prayer. And we've been talking about how we can learn to pray with power, with passion, and in a way that would help us grow in our intimacy with God. So we've been looking at four specific prayers that the Apostle Paul prayed. And our challenge is to change the way we pray. So we're not going to pray safe, small, general prayers, but as passionate followers of Jesus, we're going to pray big, God-honoring, faith-filled, and specific prayers, just like Paul prayed. So in week one, we learned to pray for power so that Christ may dwell within you. In week two, we committed to pray that we would all be active in the sharing of our faith so that we would have a full understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. And then last week, we talked about the importance of praying for unity in the body of Christ so that God would be glorified and that the world would know Jesus. So today, we're going to look at a prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed uh, for the Philippian church. And this prayer, well, is super practical. Uh, It's all about how to know what is best. Uh, So maybe you find yourself at a point of decision, decision about your job, and you're thinking, well, I wish I could just know what the best thing would be. Uh, Maybe you're trying to make a big purchase, and and you're thinking, should I buy this or should I not buy this? I wish I could just know what would be best. Maybe it's an investment. Should I make this investment or should I not make this investment? Well, I sure wish that I would know what would be the best thing. Uh, This is what the essence of Paul's prayer to the Philippian church really is in his letter. So let me give you a little bit of context here before we read it. Paul, he's writing from prison in Rome. He's writing this letter to the church in Philippi. And Paul doesn't really know what's going to happen to him. Uh, Honestly, he could have been executed at any moment. And so he's writing this letter to these people whom he dearly loves. In fact, uh, as Paul begins his letter, he says, hey, you know what? I thank my God every time that I think of you. So imagine a relationship in your life where every time you think of that person, you thank God. Uh, You love them deeply, and you're writing a letter to someone that you may not communicate again with uh, this side of heaven. And so whatever prayer it is that you're going to pray for them, it's going to be of the greatest importance. So within uh, this context is what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1. Now here's what he says in verse 9. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. So let me break this down a little bit. Uh, Paul says, I I pray that your love may abound more and more. And the first thing that logically comes to my mind is, well, what kind of love are you talking about, Paul? Because there's lots of different loves. Uh, Like we love our parents, we love our spouses, we love our kids, and we love Dr. Pepper. So what kind of love are you talking about? Well, Paul's talking about an agape type of love. And that's a love that is unconditional. It's, it's from the heart of God. It's a love that doesn't just give us what we think we want, but it is a love that gives us exactly what we need. It's an unconditional love from the heart of God to us. And so Paul says, I want this love, this kind of love, I want it to abound more and more. 
Because when you experience this kind of love, it's gonna transform you from the inside to the outside. You're gonna experience something so deep inside of you that it changes the way that you act and it changes the way that you think. It's the kind of thing that, well, it can happen to you when you become a parent. When you have a child, it just kind of transforms the way you do things, right? Like uh, you now have uh, this love that is abounding more and more. You have more knowledge and, and all of that transforms the way that you think, the way that you act and the things that you do. This is an agape type of love that Paul's talking about, this unconditional love. And God expresses this love to us in so many different ways. And once you know it, it just kind of changes you. It changes the way you see things. Uh, It begins to transform the way that you act. And where other people look at a situation and they see desperation, they see no sense of hope, but you see God at work. You see God doing something different. Why? Well, because the love of God has grown up more and more inside of you, both in knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you will be able to discern what is best. So what we have to do is to begin to let the love of God transform us from the inside to the outside. We have to allow it to change the way we do things. And so the essence of the question that Paul is asking or saying when we see this prayer is, how do I know what is best? I want to know what's best. Uh, I've got situations. I've got crazy stuff in my life, and I want to know what's best. How do I know what's best? Well, the answer is that the key to knowing what is best is knowing God. It's just that simple, and it is just that complex. Uh, It's complicated. Maybe you would say it is simply complicated. The key to knowing what is best is knowing God. And honestly, uh, that's really the essence of why you're here today, right? You really want to know God. That's what it's all about. The key to knowing what is best is found in knowing God. And God is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's uh, the creator and sustainer of the universe. And he can express his love to you in an infinite number, infinite number of ways. And the best way to understand or to discern what is best is to know God. So what I want to do is I want to give you three little things that have helped me when making decisions as I have tried to know God and try to understand what is best. So uh, the key to knowing what is best is knowing God, right? So how do I know God so that I can know what is best? Well, For one, I recognize that there are other people who know God, and and I can learn more about him from them. And so one thing that I do when making big decisions is I seek godly counsel. Um, I ask the people that I know uh, who trust and believe and follow Jesus with everything in them. And this is really uh, what the book of Proverbs teaches. It says, for the lack of counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, plans succeed. And so when I need to know what's best, I seek godly counsel, and I, I wait and see if God begins to speak through the wisdom of the leaders and the people that God has placed in my sphere of influence, godly leaders whom I trust and whom I know follow Jesus. Because here's the thing, let's be honest, as we grapple with situations and decisions in our lives, you know what, you're going to talk to people about that stuff anyway. It's human nature, right? Uh, We need to talk to people, and in many ways, it helps us to talk through to a solution. So knowing that you're going to need to talk to other people anyway, make sure that you choose wisely who those people are and seek godly counsel. And when you do that, you should begin to see a consensus of a voice uh, begin to emerge from these people. And that can help you discern the best way. The second thing that I find helpful in making decisions is to pray. Uh, Now, that really should be the first thing that we do. But if we're being honest, the truth is we tend to talk Uh, And we like to talk faster than we like to pray, right? So uh, the first thing I tend to do is talk, and then the next thing I do is that I go to prayer about it. And so I don't know what steps tend to come first for you, uh, but it's pretty important to be in prayer, especially when you're trying to know what the best way is. 
And because the key to knowing what is best is found in knowing God, we need to pray. We need to talk to God. Uh, we give him praise for who he is and for all his goodness and all of his grace. We do that when we pray. We pray and we praise. But sometimes we forget that prayer is a conversation. Uh, it's talking to God, but it's also listening for God. So uh, don't forget that you need to listen and not just talk. And it's amazing how when you listen for God, you suddenly begin to hear him. Uh, I mean, really, uh, he, he really is always trying to communicate. Uh, we just don't always uh, put ourselves in a place to listen. But when we are intentional to not just talk, but to listen, that's when we begin to hear his voice emerging. It's almost like a voice that comes from the inside that is so loud that you just can't ignore it. So, uh, number two, when you pray, pray and don't forget to listen for God. The key to knowing what is best is knowing God. So you, know, you hear Paul's prayer. Uh, I want that love to abound more and more. And how are we going to do that? We're going to seek godly counsel. We're going to pray and we're going to listen to what God is saying. And then third, when I come to a decision that I'm trying to make, I'm going to look into God's word. I read God, God's word and I listen uh, for him to speak to me through it. And so for me, what usually happens is that God, he kind of gives me like an anchor verse. Because many times, uh, if you're going to follow God and you're going to do what he says, oftentimes there's opposition uh, that's naturally going to come against you because oftentimes what God tells us to do is not the naturally logical thing in the, in the standards of the world. And so uh, I know that this has helped me to have an anchor verse, especially when people that I, uh, I feel, when God's leading me to something and I feel like maybe other people are going to start to say, hey, you know what, have you gone crazy? Are you sure that you're doing the right thing? Do you have any idea what you're doing? Well, I can keep going back to the word that God gave me. Uh, I remember from his word that is, this is what he said to me. Uh, and can I tell you that uh, when you step out in faith, when you follow after God, and when you walk in obedience to him, he's going to lead you to some things that are different. He's going to lead you to some things that maybe don't even make sense to you at the time, things that go against the flow of the norm. And so uh, we need to prepare for opposition to come against us. And one way that we can do that is hanging on to the word that God spoke to us. So let me see if I can just kind of um, land this plane a little bit by sharing with you a verse that God has utilized in my life to, to, to speak to me as I have sought to understand what is best and how to know him more, sought to let his love abound more and more on the inside, both in knowledge and depth, depth of insight. And why do I do that? So that I can try to discern what is best, right? So remember, this is the essence of what Paul's praying here for his dear friends in the Philippian church. So uh, he's saying, listen, let, let God's love, let that agape love abound in you more and more. It's important. Don't miss it. You need it. And you need it because then you will be able to better discern what is best, no matter what the situation that life throws at you. So for me, uh, there's this book in, uh, called Numbers, and in chapter 11 uh, is a verse that God used to speak to me. So let me give you a little bit of context of this situation. What's going on is that Moses has led the Egyptians, uh, I'm sorry, led the Israelites out of Egypt because they were in bondage, right? They were slaves to the Egyptians, and they had been crying out for God to uh, bring them deliverance, for God to release them. And so God sends Moses, and Moses goes to Pharaoh, and Moses says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, nope. And so then God brings plague after plague after plague on the people, and finally, uh, Pharaoh relinquishes, and he says, uh, get out of here. I don't even want you here anymore. Just leave. And to make a, a very long story a little bit shorter, uh, they leave Egypt, right? So God parts the Red Sea, they go out into the desert, and here God is supernaturally providing food for the Israelites, uh, and he's providing it through something called manna. So what this was, was like, um, it was like a dew from heaven that came down. 
And they would go out and they would collect it off the ground and, and then they would kind of grind it up and make these uh, sweet cakes and that's what they would eat. So um, the problem though was that they were growing tired of the manna. Uh, they had been eating it over and over and over again and the Israelites, they're, they're beginning to grumble. So forget the fact that God delivered us from slavery. I'm upset because I'm tired of eating manna day after day after day. And so that's where we're going to pick up the story in Numbers chapter 11, verse 5. We see the Israelites grumbling. And this is what they're saying, verse 5. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Okay. So come on now, like the fish. Man, do you remember the fish that we used to eat in Egypt? You know what? It didn't cost us anything. Well, when I read that, I just think, uh, you're crazy because you were a slave. What do you mean it didn't cost you anything? But they're like, oh, the fish, oh my goodness. And the cucumbers, don't even get me started on the cucumbers. And the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, it was so good. I, I just wish that we could go back there. But we've lost our appetite now because all we ever have is this manna. I mean, how ridiculous, right? And, I, and I'm reading this and I'm just sitting here thinking, God delivered you from the bondage of slavery and you're worried about the leeks and the garlic and the onions. Come on, let's get a little bit of perspective here, right? But the truth is, don't we kind of do the same thing? God, uh, please just bring this situation about and God does something that's powerful and amazing and, and now uh, you're just sitting there kind of like, eh, I don't even want it anymore. I'm going to go find something else to complain about. We do that. We just begin to bring a bad attitude on us, and, and we just continue to complain. And I don't know about you, but I, I do this sometimes. Sometimes I feel like an Israelite. And, oh, Lord, forgive us for those times, right? Well, anyway, Moses, he's listening to all of this complaining, and he's getting a little upset. Uh, he's a little bit fired up. And honestly, uh, God's a little wee bit angry about this too. And so Moses now begins this conversation with God. And so he says over here in verse 12, this is what he says, Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised in oath to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. This burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, please just go ahead and kill me. Well, what is Moses doing? It sounds a little bit like Moses is complaining to God, like he's arguing with God. Uh, he's, he's telling God all of this stuff. But really what Moses is doing is he's praying. That's, that's actually what he's doing, and maybe you don't see it that way because it doesn't look like that in your prayer life, right? Your typical prayer maybe doesn't look like that, but he's talking to God, and so we would categorize that in the Christian world as prayer. Moses, he's praying, and he's being real, and he's like, you know what, God, I am tired of these people. They want their leeks, they want their garlic, all of this nonsense. Uh, where am I going to get meat for them? Uh, God, I don't understand. Uh, God, if this is uh, all there is, why don't you just go ahead and kill me because I am tired of dealing with these people. He's being honest. He's being real. And maybe for you and me, maybe we need a good dose of this in our own prayer lives too. Because for some reason, we tend to want to hide all of that stuff from God. But God already knows how we feel. <laughs> and all we're really doing is trying to hide behind pleasant words. Well, Moses isn't doing that. He's like, uh, you know what, God, if you're going to treat me like this, just kill me. I'm tired of all of this. I am frustrated. I'm done. And some of us don't like his prayer because we're not real in our own prayers. 
And you just have to be able to be real with God. Why? Because you know what? God is way big enough for what you're thinking and what you're feeling. You and I act like uh, we've got to bring some pretense to our prayer and all this other stuff. But God already knows your thoughts anyway. So why don't you just go ahead and tell him? I promise you, it'll make you feel better. You can trust me on that one. Just express yourself to God in prayer. And then check out what happened to Moses here. Moses listens to God, and God says this to him in verse 16. The Lord said to Moses, Bring me 70 of Israel's leaders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take some of the power of the Spirit that is on you and put it on them. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. Oh, man, that's amazing stuff, right? Moses, I'm going to bring people around you who can help you. Uh, but wait, God says, there's more. Verse 18, tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat. We were better off in Egypt. But now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. And you will not eat it just for one day or two days or five, ten, or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? And Moses is like, yes, thank you, Lord. Um, but, but Lord, wait, there's a lot of people. Do you know that? So he goes on in verse 21. But Moses said, well, here I am among 600,000 men on foot. And you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the, in the sea were caught for them? Moses is like, that's a lot of people. God, if I killed every cow on every hillside that I can see, it still wouldn't be enough. So he's like, God, well, thank you, but honestly, how are you going to make that work? And then it happens. Uh, and this is the anchor verse coming up here. Uh, God drops a God bomb. But before I tell you what it is, pause for a minute and think about the situations in your life. And the word of faith that God has given you to stand on. Are you doubting how God's going to make it all happen? Because it doesn't make sense. Uh, God, this is too big. How is it even going to be possible? Well, God says to you and he says to me the same thing he said to Moses out in the desert in verse 23. The Lord answered Moses, is the Lord's arm too short? Boom. Drop the mic. Right? Like, is there anything that is impossible for God? Uh, what could possibly we ever come up with that's too hard for God? Is there any one thing that you or I could ever imagine that is ever too hard for God? No, absolutely nothing. Is his arm too short to reach you? Uh, this is the God that owns the cattle on a thousand hillsides, the God that spoke the world into existence. He created the heavens and the earth and all that is within them with the sound of his voice. Is the Lord's arm too short? short. Maybe that's the anchor verse that God is giving you today as you're trying to make uh, the right decision. But here's the thing, uh, so often as we're trying to make the right decisions, you know what, we're actually asking the wrong questions. We're looking through the wrong lens. We think we want to know what's best, but really we mostly want to know what's easiest. We want to know what makes us feel good. And so <clears throat> we end up asking those wrong questions. But you see, when we really seek after God, when we really want to know him, when we really want to know what his best is, to know his love and his grace and his peace and, a, and his power, uh, when we are transformed by his love that abounds more and more as we get to know him more and more, as we seek godly counsel, as we pray and as we listen, as we let him shoot those anchor verses into our hearts, you know what, church? It will change the way you live. And there is so much power 
in that. Church, the key to knowing what is best is knowing God. Are you asking the right questions and are you listening for the right answers? And will you seek after him today that he may be glorified in your life and your situation that you may know what is best. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I just, uh, just thank you. I thank you and praise you for this day. I thank you for the, the opportunity that you give us to, uh, to, to pray, the opportunity you give us to seek godly counsel, the opportunity that you give us to listen to your voice in our lives, the opportunity uh, to, to read your word and to seek your voice and, and the opportunity for you to speak in those ways. God, we just want to thank you for that. We thank you that you even care about the things, uh, the decisions, the, uh, the, the day-to-day stuff that we're dealing with. You care about it, and you've given us the tools that we need to navigate it well. God, I pray that you would help us to understand that the only way that we're going to know what is best is to know you more and more, to let your love abound, to let your love grow deeper, uh, to let your love change us from the inside to the outside. When we seek after you, we will know what the best decision to make is because you will never uh, leave us. You'll never forsake us. You are always speaking. You are always inviting us to come to you. God, we're just so very grateful that you care about us that much. God, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to um, get really for real in our prayers, that we wouldn't, uh, that we wouldn't feel like we have to, uh, to use words uh, that are pleasant and put on all this pretense, but that we could just be for real with you. We could talk it through with you that we could stop and listen uh, because you already know what we're dealing with and sometimes we just need to recognize it and recognize it in your presence as well. Sometimes we just need to, we just need to lay it all uh, before you and let you move in ways that only you can do. So God, we pray that you would just continue uh, to, to work in us, to speak to us, uh, and to help us to live lives that give you glory. We thank you and we praise you for all that you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know what the Lord is speaking to you today through this message, but your invitation is to identify what next steps he might be calling you to take. So maybe it's a conversation, maybe it's information, maybe it's something that God's already spoken to your heart, but you've pushed back against it. Today's the day you say, I'm going to stop pushing and I'm just going to embrace what it is God's leading me to do. Whatever it is, we invite you to connect with us. If we can be of assistance to you in any way, we'd be honored to talk with you, to pray with you, to do life with you, that together we might grow closer and closer to Jesus.